point is that we're not, uh, we're not just chasing uh, renewable energy in the form of solar collectors and, and wind machines. We are uh, devising ever more effective ways of reducing carbon emissions with the goal of getting to net zero. When I say net zero, I mean uh, zero with sequestration making up for whatever residual carbon may be in the environment. We're talking about a radically changed uh, economy, technology uh, world, and it has to be the world. This is a world economic forum, and we also need a world environmental forum, uh, a world investment forum where we all work together. And I might say in that respect, as you brought up uh, California and the summit, that uh, sovereignty has a role, but uh, climate change does not recognize sovereignty. It occurs globally. And California has been subject to horrible uh, fires that are among the worst the state has ever had. And they are uh, a forerunner of worst fires to come through global warming, drought, and extreme weather. We saw what happened in uh, the Carolinas. We've seen what happened uh, in Puerto Rico. We see what's happened in Texas and uh, in the Philippines and other places in the world. Uh, climate is going to uh, insert itself uh, all over the globe. And sovereignty is no barrier uh, to the climate. So in that sense, the world has to collaborate. And our climate summit was a collaboration of subnational governments, states, provinces, regions, and some national governments, together with cities, uh, uh, corporation executives, uh, nonprofit representatives. So these are the people that, while the national governments uh, fiddle around with their quondam political uh, excitements, uh, we came together in San Francisco to confront the uh, global threat of, of warming and drought and mass migrations and starvation and all the other outcomes that we want to forestall. And there was a lot of commitment, increased ambition, and now we have to move that to the next level. And that next level will be fought out in America uh, during the November elections and then afterwards in 2020 and will be also fought out in every country of the world and expressed at the various conference of the parties, at various other interim meetings. But I would say it's uh, time for all hands on deck to recognize the perilous uh, position that citizens of the world are now in and to take the scientifically based solutions that are available and can be implemented if there is the political will. And that we must generate by climate summits, by meetings such as this, and all other ways uh, that we can mobilize the political will to start getting on the side of nature instead of trying to uh, fight with it, uh, because it will ultimately win. Let's delve a little bit deeper into those actions. What are some of the recommendations that have come out of the summit? Um, and for local governments or businesses can take to really do their part. As you've said, you know, some nations have pulled back and others have come forward uh, trying to tackle this issue. So what well, can they do? Well, it's very simple. First, you have to monitor where are you. Well, each company should know its carbon emissions, what, what, what it's doing, and then take uh, steps to reach a zero carbon emission. Of course, that's going to be hard in the case of oil companies since that carbon is their business. But they, too, will join with everyone else uh, to forestall the uh, horrific damages that continued climate warming will create. So it's first, um, understand your emissions. Two, develop a strategy of reducing them. And number three, make the investments and the decisions uh, to get to the zero emission. You've also talked about, or California has been a first mover. It's been an early adopter. How can we persuade others um, to join that movement? How can we incentivize them? Well, the only, a lot of people are doing 
uh, climate action all over the world. It just so happens that uh, carbon emissions are still rising. And they're rising in China, they're ri r rising in India, a lot of other places. Uh, and in fact, I think they're rising uh, in California. So we have work to do locally, globally. So it's the same thing. The scientists do the research. They tell us what's happening. Uh, the investors and the researchers develop the technologies that we can use to reduce our emissions. Uh, and then number three, the academics, the uh, uh, social entrepreneurs, the politicians, the educators all pull together to generate the uh, agreement, the understanding, and the collaboration to get it done. And that's something that's happening all over the world. And this uh, World Economic Forum is, is a part of that uh, global process. Can you share with us some of the examples of some of the good work that you've seen being done? Well, I just showed California's example that we're, uh, so we've set a goal, not of low carbon, but zero carbon. That's, we got to get it straight. Uh, that's where we have to go. Um, I, there were many companies that made commitments to reduce their emissions. It's, a, it's simple to conceptualize. Whatever your emissions are, lower them and aim toward zero emissions. Now, in some places, that's virtually impossible, but there are technologies, there are alternative practices, and the people that came there made hundreds of commitments uh, that are on our webpage that will indicate what those are. You talked about the, um, the power of technology. Um, here at the World Economic Forum, we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, um, how drones, AI, um, artificial intelligence are gonna revolutionize the way that we live yeah. um, and we work. How, what impact will that have on climate change? And what do you see uh, the solution that we can also harness from there? Well, first of all, uh, revolutionize through AI and all the other technologies, we ho the revolution could also be extinction. Uh, never before has humanity had the power to destroy at such a uh, global level. And we ought to recognize that. It's not just nuclear warheads, of which uh, Russia and the US have over 7,000 each uh, that can deliver mass destruction in a matter of hours. And we have eight other countries that are in various other positions of destruction. Uh, but uh, bio-error or bioterrorism, uh, bio-experimentation, that's a big risk. And uh, the, all the industrial uh, means of progress have as their negative corollary emissions. So we have to uh, transform our technologies from destruction to construction, to construct a viable, benign path instead of the malign descent into greater uh, climate disruption. So yeah, AI is just speeding everything up. And the problem is technology is moving faster than human insight or human wisdom. It's not enough to build uh, a more powerful toy or a more powerful set of algorithms. We have to develop the uh, and, and reward the human wisdom to uh, exercise restraint and uh, proper uh, balancing of what we deploy. And that really makes the whole question of human survival an open question. So nothing is more important than to deal with this topic. <clears throat> you talked about how technology can be harnessed, um, but also how can you ensure, or what are the tools that we can use to make sure that this transformation that's happening is inclusive. Uh, you talked about a lot of people coming at the table um, and the fact that you're trying to um, leverage this engagement that's happening, but how can we ensure while we're building these new infrastructure that they're uh, diverse? Well, one thing, you know, the Army is very inclusive uh, and it's a killing machine, that's what it's, so inclusion is, is good, but we wanna get the goal in the right direction. So we want everyone on board, but we want the ship sailing in the right direction. Right now, the ship is sailing in the wrong direction. And sometimes it's not diverse, sometimes it is, 
But what is most important is that we control our technology and we recognize the perils and start uh, pulling back from the abyss. And as we do that, a greater equality, a greater inclusion has to be part of our educational, business, and whole social policy. Uh, but the, the key point, there, there's uh, social inequality, but then there's moving to destruction. So we, we, we gotta keep our eye on the main threat as we open up our uh, social roles and opportunities uh, to the widest array of, of human, uh, human beings. That is a very stark reality that you, you've painted well, for us. That is the reality. Most of the people want to lull you, want you to feel that you, know, you just had a nice cookie or <laughs> you'll have a nice little dinner tonight, so it's okay. But I'm here to tell you it's not okay. We're on a path that is ultimately destructive. It will lead to mass famines, um, agricultural decline in productivity, and migrations like you've never seen before. That is, if we don't listen to the lessons of the scientists, of uh, the Paris Agreement, of the San Francisco Climate Action Summit, we are being given the information uh, to pull back from the brink and go in a more uh, in a, a positive direction. So that, uh, my message is not one of fear, but one of awakening and uh, clarity. Seeing where we are and seeing that we have the tools, the technology uh, to move in a sustainable direction and getting all of our institutions moving in that, uh, in that direction. That's the goal and because it involves everything, it, 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 it does get, uh, it's hard to talk about it. It's also hard to execute on it. So w what do you believe is preventing leaders from hearing that call or taking action on it? Um, the world works uh, because of fossil fuel. It w uh, the, the prosperity, the population, the technology, all that came out of coal, oil, and gas. And now we're being asked to uh, ultimately eliminate all three of those. Uh, that's not something we get to easily. Our habits are based on fossil fuel, and we have to transform to a renewable, sustainable uh, kind of uh, economy and technology. So that's just not easy. And because it's a sophisticated idea, it's not one that uh, is easily presented in the, in the world of uh, political discussion. So it challenges the creativity of leaders and educators and scientists to put the truth out there again and again and again. And that's what we're doing and that's what we have to do. Uh, yesterday Al Gore said that the maximum uh, political will um, it falls kind of short of the minimum that's necessary for us to reach COP21. Uh, uh, that that's another way of saying what I've been trying Exactly. To. So there is a lot of people who, who agree with you. Um, then what are you, what is your call to action then for the, the citizens, people like myself? What would, can we do uh, to help you? Vote out all the climate deniers at the first possible opportunity. Anybody who says climate uh, change is unreal or a hoax, vote for their opponent. That's the first thing to do. State, local, national. Uh, secondly, uh, inform yourself as, to, as best you can of what the current science is telling us and then look for positive opportunities in your own life because we can live more sustainably in uh, what we do, what we buy, and how we live. So we can all be a part of the solution. You, you also said that there's some solutions that we can do, um, and then you've presented us with you know, this urgent call for action. What are the, some of the exponential solutions um, that you want others to take on? Um, you've talked about what California is doing. Uh, what are the others, like in civil society, that they can do also to be part of that? 
Well, uh, unfortunately, a lot of this is dependent on government, le government leadership. Uh, you or I can't do anything about the buildup of nuclear weapons and their use. That ultimately decides, that's Mr. Putin, Mr. Trump, uh, Mr. Xi, and all the other uh, seven countries that have nuclear weapons. Well, with climate change, we need, uh, we need, for example, a price on carbon. Only the government can do that. But business can, can help, and business are in the private sector. So we're in a situation where it's not your local school board. It's not your local recycling center. We are talking about a, a, a all-inclusive globalized threat. So we do have to look to our leaders in the churches, in the schools and universities, in, in politics, in the military. Those uh, people at the top are going to have to lead the way. And we munchkins at the bottom are going to have to do what we can. But we're very dependent on the, uh, on the big shots. I'm sorry to say, as a, mi as a minor big shot myself, I can tell you we got to do it. We have to do everything we can, and we're not. So we're setting a very bad example uh, for the non-big shots. You're coming to the term of your limit um, on January 7th. Um, what are your, I mean, the world is your oyster. What's well, next the world, for you? The world is not my oyster or anyone else's oyster. It's a big damn problem uh, and, a, and a great opportunity. So what am I going to do? Yes. Ask me on January 7th. I got a lot to do. Okay. I have seven, 174 uh, proposed uh, pieces of legislation. So the work is not done? What? So the work is not done? There's well, still it's not done, no. <laughs> Tomorrow afternoon, I'll be signing or vetoing bills into the wee hours of the night. So California, there's a lot to do. And I've got about 100 days to do it. So I'm going to use every... But there'll be a lot of things. There'll be many... I'll have a few surprises before we're finished. <laughs> So on that note, I'd like to open up the floor for any questions we might have in the room. Uh, just please state your name uh, and the organization you're with. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, so I'm Catherine Cheney, and I work for DevEx. We're a media platform focused on international development. And my question for you is what message you have for donors and NGOs working on climate finance, because despite growing recognition, um, as was the focus of your summit, that subnational actors can really drive change on climate. A lot of the funding is still going to the national governments. So I'm just curious what message you have on financing for climate change and how can it actually start to go to the subnational actors? Well, all the, the subnational leaders, political leaders, have to encourage the uh, business leaders, the financial leaders, to make the appropriate investments in renewable energy and lower polluting technologies and low carbon uh, activities of one kind or another. So the money, you have to go where the money is, which are in the hedge funds, the banks, pension funds, and we can do something. California has uh, some pension funds. We have hundreds of billions of dollars. I think there's an area there where we can encourage uh, uh, the investment uh, priorities to include uh, resiliency and uh, finance in the uh, lesser developed worlds where they, they are very short of the capital. Unfortunately, uh, the world's spending a trillion on uh, weapons and military. We wouldn't have to divert too much of that uh, to get the necessary investment and meet the $100 billion goal uh, that, that we need for fulfilling the Paris Agreement. But for, there's just a certain amount of uh, diversion from where we ought to go. And I think our pension funds and our companies can play an important role. Thank you. And one follow-up to that. Um, I wonder if you could expand on um, the Under Two Coalition that you co-founded. And I think one of the things that could help drive progress in terms of funding going to subnational actors is when those subnational actors come together in networks um, so can you just talk about the Under Two Coalition and um, lessons learned, what worked, what didn't, and if you think that's a good model moving forward? Well, the Under Two is probably not good. Uh, well, to the extent that Under Two includes uh, private sector people, uh, co companies, they can certainly invest in sustainable programs 
that can't affect uh, third world countries. As far as its states and cities, uh, many of the political leaders have influence on their pension funds. So there's massive sums of money there that could uh, focus more on necessary sustainable investments. So that's, that's something we can do. And the third thing is that uh, cities and states can be isolated. And by being part of the under two coalition, they come together to see the progress that their colleagues are making and that they're part of a much larger movement committed uh, to under two degrees centigrade. That is the movement of the under two. Our grand national uh, leaders are not making that uh, commitment uh, operational as of this moment. There's a stall, a slackening of effort. So the under two groups can, in their own nations, uh, build the political will and the support and take the action that they're allowed legally in their own states and cities, building regulations, um, uh, electric uh, uh, chargers uh, in, in, in cities. There's a lot of things that recycling, uh, better use of water. So individual cities and states can take their own effort and take their own action, and then by uh, becoming more aware of what others are doing can keep, uh, keep committed because it's very easy to get discouraged. If you look at what's happening, you could say, wow, we're never going to get it done. So that's why it's so important for a climate action summit to demonstrate, yes, there are very serious people uh, doing serious things to come to terms and to minimize uh, carbon emissions. So that solidarity aspect is critical as part of the mission of the Under Two Coalition. Hi, Governor. Matty Stanislaus, uh, Will Resources Institute, uh, Circle Economy Fellow. Uh, in addressing the gap in NDC's uh, optimizing circular economy, which essentially means to uh, reduce the tremendous explosion of raw materials, is viewed as one of the top levers of addressing the gap. Uh, can you tell me whether that came up at all in the summit and whether there's any possibility of building that into carbon trading schemes? Um, well, first of all, the carbon trading schemes are themselves subject to controversy. Uh, California has a cap and trade along with Quebec and uh, the other carbon trading schemes are rather minimal, except for the uh, EU, which is doing, uh, now raise their carbon price, I'm told, to 20, 25 uh, euros a ton. So that's good. In terms of the circular economy, um, well, I just banned uh, plastic straws. Or that's a very little step. But we're moving in the direction of recognizing that once use is, is not acceptable. And I think those, that is a, really a product of government regulation. Uh, the government saying, no, thou shalt not do that, and thou shalt recycle. So uh, I think that's a matter of government uh, authority uh, following political belief and consensus, adopting rules uh, to bring us closer to a circular economy and to avoid uh, the, the massive waste I mean, if you look, walk down the street here, you see all these big trucks and all the cookies and cups and chairs and plastic and all the rest of I mean, you wonder, how in the world can we ever make this a circular economy? How can we ever get to zero emission? I think that's a topic that's worth reflecting on. Uh, but it's quite um, daunting, just right where we are, to get this in a zero carbon position. And um, the recycling effort is very important. And all we can do is adopt uh, goals, 2030, uh, zero waste or 70 percent waste, whatever it is. Each jurisdiction has to set a goal. Then they got to count. They got to uh, measure what's going on, and they have to set a goal to make things better. It's this is the goal. The trouble is, even as you talk about World, World Economic Forum, it's about economics. We had a president named Bill Clinton who got elected president on the theme, it's the economy stupid. And I have to say, it's the ecology. It's the ecology. I won't say stupid. I'll say wise, uh, interdependent human being. <laughs> it's the ecology. 
And by that I mean it's the interactive pattern of, of all the species and materials in circulation that we have to make work. And the economy is a more linear subset of the overall ecology, and it's narrow and destructive if not uh, tamed and structured within the, the rules of nature, the rules of, of habitat, the rules of, of um, uh, multiple sp species diversity, as well as human diversity. So uh, we have a big job to go from the World Economic Forum to the World Human Forum, to the World Nature Human Forum. Uh, so even our language is very biased and oriented toward money, toward return on investment. Well, uh, you even meet uh, people, student, young people, who say, oh, what's my R, what is it, REI? Give, ROI. What's, ROI, what's the ROI? So they're brainwashed already that maybe learning, um, you know, I said to somebody, you know, why don't you study English or literature? He said, what's the ROI in that? So we have a lot of, of um, discovery and learning and dissemination of, of clearer ideas about what it takes to survive, to sustain, to create true prosperity. And there's a superficial prosperity, and uh, we got a lot of it, but it is not a sustainable prosperity, and therefore it is, it's actually false unless we uh, move it into a sustainable uh, frame. On that note, uh, this call for a higher purpose, uh, I'd like to thank you, Governor Brown, for thank joining you. us. Uh, and I'd like to thank our audience online for joining us. Thank you. Good, thank you. Remember, it's the ecology, not just the economy. <laughs>